warm welcome for our hero, Aiden Chambers. What we're doing today is um, explained in that book. There are some things that won't be in there, some things which will need to be explained. If you don't know the book, it doesn't matter. Because what we're going to do is try this now. Here's a word I'm careful of. Uh, it's an English um, difficulty. What I'm giving you is not a method. There is no step-by-step -step way of doing it. It's an art. And one of the things that frightens a lot of teachers when they start doing it is that they're afraid they won't be able to manage because there isn't a step-by-step -step rule as to how to do it. Courage, mon ami. <laughs> be courageous. Trust the kids. They always have things to say. And what we're going to talk about depends on them saying things, but it also depends on your skill in how to handle that without telling them what to think. So the theory that is behind all this is the idea of a democratic discussion. That is, if you take 12 people or more, ideally 12 to 15, or no more than 20, ideally, those people, if they are, here's another English expression, similarly qualified, in other words, they come from the same kind of culture, they've read roughly the same kind of thing. Uh, you can give them any puzzle, you can talk about anything to them, and they will have things to say which will surprise not only you, but the children themselves. Because what we now know from the brain scientists is that when you put 12 or 15 people together and they start to think seriously and with concentration. It's as if they each one were a battery, an electric battery. This is a bad metaphor, but it works. On their own, each battery only has a certain amount of life in it. It's only got a certain amount of power. If you link them all up, then you get a lot more power. Now that's what's happening in that kind of democratic discussion. Each person has something to say that they know. They're not guessing, they're not inventing, they know that, they say it, that surprises somebody else who hadn't thought that, who say something else in reply to that, and gradually this grows into a meaning that none of them could have thought for themselves. It's bigger than anyone. Individually, we are not enough on our own. We are a herd animal. Never forget that the human being is an animal. We are an animal who lives by our senses, the five of them, and our sensate experience, which then makes us more than an animal because we can intellectualize it. That's how we work. And every child has to grow through that history. Every child, when it's born, is a little animal. It isn't filled with thoughts. It isn't filled with intellectual ideas. How does it acquire them? by imitating. Everything we learn that matters, we learn by imitating. <coughs> For instance, think about speech. We learn how to speak by imitating, copying the people around us who can speak. That's why we have the accent we have. That's why we have the kind of vocabulary we have. That's why we have the kind of taboos about what can be said and what cannot be said. We even learn mannerisms that way, mannerisms of speech. We learn by imitating. We learn to read by imitating. We learn to read by hearing people who can do it, doing it for us before we can do it. And the key to learning to read is listening and seeing what is being read. Now, there's a map for this. Ah, oh, this is going to challenge us. Thank goodness. There's the map. That's in the book. I want to go through it very quickly. This is, a, this is revision. <laughs> you know all this. But we need to say it to remind ourselves before we come to the hardcore job we're here today to do, because it's important. 
Let's start at the top. It is impossible to read anything if there is nothing there to read. Think about this room without what we have brought into it. It is an empty space. If you were to put people in here who can't read and left them, fed them, looked after them, all that, would they turn out to be readers? No, they can't because there is nothing to read. The person who would have been most comfortable in this room is Socrates, who didn't write. He actually said, if you learn to write and read, you will lose your memory. How do we know he said that? Because Plato wrote it down. <laughs> now, he would have recognized this because this is a Greek theater. It is the beginning of our cultural learning. The Hebraic, Greek, Christian, religious basis of the culture. It began like this. Someone speaking a drama and the others auditing it, listening and making sense of it, interpreting it. But of course, that's not reading. Therefore, unless children are given a rich variety of books that they would wish to read, as well as the ones we wish them to read, they will never become competent readers. Therefore, this is the English version, I'm sorry, but it's in Dutch in your own books. It, it, de it depends. Everything we're going to do this afternoon depends on the book stock. What is there? How much is there? What kind is there? It depends on whether it is immediately available. In 1943, 44, I was in a classroom. There were no books on show at all. There was a locked cupboard. And in the cupboard were some books. On a Friday afternoon, the cupboard was opened. We were made to take a book and take it home. On Monday morning, we were made to put the books back and the, the cupboard was locked. The teacher never said a word about the books. I couldn't read till I was nine. That partly has to do with it. I'm slightly dyslexic, but they didn't know that then. But I couldn't read because there was nothing to read. We didn't have anything in the house either. So everything's going to depend on that, and it's going to depend on you being able to get it what is there when you want it. Not just that it's in the room, but that you can get at it. And it's going to depend on how you display it. Everybody who has a shop knows how the window display is essential. It's going to draw in the customers. When they're in there, how things are displayed will determine whether they impulse buy, which is what you depend on if you're a shopkeeper. But you are a shopkeeper. You're selling reading. And you're selling it not with money, but with emotion. Because these little people, up to our age, are animals who respond to stimuli and look for pleasure. Give them pleasure, they'll win, you'll win, but give them pleasure of a kind they didn't know they wanted till they've got it and you're teaching. Why have teachers if all they do is give children what children already know they want? What is the point of the teacher? The kids already know they want it. They probably got it. Why bother with it? Why should we pay you? What are you there for? to take the children where they cannot go on their own and to do it fast so that they grow fast, but not so fast that you kill them. <laughs> so this is like greenhouse growing of plants, rare plants. If you don't tend to them properly with the right heat, the right water, light, light they'll die. If you overdo the water and the heat, they'll grow out of proportion and die again. Teaching is an art. It's like gardening. You have to give that plant what it needs when it needs it and get the balance right of what you're giving it and what you're asking to do with it when they've got it. Now, okay. Oh, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> there we go. Um, look at the word reading. There's a problem here in English. English is a word f full of synonyms. 
That's why it's a, a, a language that has covered the world. It's not just because of the American empire has spread it. It has spread because of all the languages in the world, to my best of my knowledge, it has the most words. In other words, for any one idea, you can get four or five words that look like synonyms. They appear to mean the same, but they never do. There's always a subtle difference, one between the other. And the great writers, of course, Shakespeare is at the head of it, choose precisely the right word to get the nuance of meaning that they want with the rhythm that they want. Remember, language is music that happens to make intellectual sense. All language is based on music. What does that mean? All education will begin with poetry. <coughs> poetry is the heart of the language. And you should be giving that to children every day of their lives. If I had the misfortune to be the Secretary of State for Education, I would pass a law that every teacher at every level, including university, should at some point in every lesson say a little piece of poetry that is the best that the language can provide. We're going to do it right now so that I practice what I preach. <laughs> Remember, music does not have to make intellectual sense. Nursery rhymes don't make sense. Hickory dickory dock, the mouse ran up the clock. The clock struck one, the mouse ran down, hickory dickory dock. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> and yet we teach it to children. <laughs> Here's a bit. Don't worry about the meaning. Full fathom five, thy father lies. Of his bones are coral made. Those are pearls that were his eyes. Nothing of him that doth fade, but hath suffered a sea change into something rich and strange. Sea nymphs hourly ring his knell. Hark! Now I hear them, ding, dong, bell. That's the simplest piece of English I can give you, and it is Shakespeare. It is from the final play, The Tempest, and it is a song sung by Ariel, the spirit. It is a wonderful piece of work. How long did it take me to say that to you? Half a minute? Do that every lesson with something like that. Five lines as good as that and you are educating your children to be linguistic, literary thinkers. You do not have to explain it. They'll come to it. It's taken me 50 years to come to grips with Shakespeare, and I still don't understand half of it. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's worth it. <laughs> so, this word reading is difficult, because when I was a child, teachers thought, they were taught this, that you could read, once you could read out the words in the sentence. The cat sat on the mat. Good, you're a reader. The, t the teacher hadn't to do any more. Wrong. <laughs> that is wrong. You're not a reader then. Reading is a number of things. First, you cannot read anything without it taking a certain amount of time. Reading is a function of time. For example, I'm going to try a trick to see what happens. I'm closing that off. Here's this book I wrote. It's in English. It has no pictures in it. What is the use of a book, said Alice, which has no pictures in it? How long would it take you to read this? How long did it take you to read it in Dutch? Not all in one go. Now, I can tell you that my wife, not now because we're both about 80 and we're getting slow, <laughs> but when she was about 40, she could have read that in an hour. Mind you, she didn't read, remember much of it afterwards. <laughs> me, and I wrote it, takes me two days, literally eight-hour days. I am very slow because of the dyslexic problem I have. In other words, here in the same household are two equally qualified people, my wife, an American, highly educated university, me, English, half-educated English. We've read pretty much the same stuff, we see the same films, we like the same music, and yet she can read a book in half the time that I can read it in. And that's going to be true of every child in your classroom. There's the teaching problem. 
If you ask them to read something for themselves in class, some are going to be finished a long time before the others have, and the ones who have finished get bored. And the ones who haven't finished feel a failure. It's a teaching problem. How do you get round it? Oops. <laughs> Sorry. It'll come up. Oops. By hearing it done. Reading aloud is the key to reading. That should happen just like a piece of poetry every day. The best time it happens is when mum and dad are doing it, when grandpa and grandmother are doing it, when aunts and uncles are doing it, because that's the cultural family. And the imitation happens then. Your loved uncle does it, so I'll do it. Your loved uncle does it this way, so I'll do it this way. Your teacher does it this way, I'll try to do it this way. We can't get away without hearing it done. At every level. Take university. Here's a kid, quite clever, leaves school, 18 year old, first week in university. What do we do to them? We give them a long reading list. They go and get the books. And they open the first one, and most of it is in language they have not yet even encountered. And they feel very vulnerable. Then the teacher, the lecturer, comes in and talks as though they could understand all this and asks them to write an essay about it. Bad news. Half the essays will be awful. Why? Because they haven't heard how that music works. If the lecturer had come in and just read the first chapter or the first pages, it would have got into their heads, oh, that's how it works. I can do that. And you feel successful. Success is always part of becoming a learner. The more successful you feel, the more you learn. And there it's happening. Hearing it done and then doing it for yourself, but requiring time. That's the program. The, edit, the enabling adult, who's not necessarily only a teacher. Librarians do this. Parents do this. Other people do this. Help the child to do that. Help them select the books, read aloud to them, and give them time to read. However, begin at the top again. The moment that you see a book, before you've even picked it up, you respond to it because you're an animal. You'll respond to the look of it, to the size of it, to the appearance of it. You'll feel, oh, I want that or I don't want that. You simply can't help it. It's your experiential phenomenology. It's how you work. That's the first base. And as you read the thing, things happen to you. You like it or you don't like it. You're puzzled by it or you see the way this is going, what this, person, what this story is doing. And if you wanted to, you could talk about that. Everybody can talk about the reality of their experience that they have consciously felt or thought. Everybody can do that if they want to. It's not an academic exercise. And indeed, people do it all the time. Um, to get here from my hotel, I'm in that um, hotel called the Hilton down the road here. That is an experience in itself. <laughs> but when I come along here to here, there's some cafes. Yeah? And here are people sitting outside the cafe. Chatter, 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 chatter. What are they all chattering about? Now, I can't understand the Dutch outside eavesdrop, but I know what they're chattering about at home. They're chattering about their family, their job, their sports, their stuff they've seen, on, on, on. They're gossiping. What's the definition of gossip? Gossip is the story of our life told by our tongue in everyday episodes to our best friend. That's how it works. And all soap operas on the television are doing that, aren't they? They're about a set of characters who we get to know, things happen to them, day after day after day, and we love it. And yet they're boring. <laughs> they're totally boring. <laughs> what makes it so interesting? The way it's done. <laughs> the drama. The turning of that gossip into an art. Now, gossip is the basis of all learning literature. What we're going to do today is form of gossip. But it's not gossip like over the coffee cups. 
which has no agenda, it just follows its nose, one thing to the next, nobody's thinking, what am I going to say next? What's the next topic? We don't have an agenda. When you formalize that in teaching, then you give it an agenda without the learner knowing that you have. They just think it's gossip. Later they learn that you've done this, and we're going to play that game in a minute. Now, the response that most teachers want to this is that the kid chooses a book, reads it, likes it so much, they come to the teacher and say, uh, I really enjoyed this book, have you got another one like it? Yes? You've had this? Who hasn't? <laughs> but what does that mean? What does, have you got another one like it, mean? Has this occurred to you? Do you know what's in that kid's head? It never occurred to me until one day, many, many, many years ago, I was talking to 150 kids in Glasgow, uh, in Scotland, about a set of books which I had edited and that were meant for them, teenage stories. And when I talked about the books and said, is there anything you want to say? A girl, she was 14, put up her hand and said, why aren't there more animal stories in this selection of books? And I don't know why I said it, but I said, what do you mean by an animal story? And she said, Planet of the Apes. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, I was a school librarian. I would not have catalogued Planet of the Apes as an animal book. I'd have catalogued it as science fiction. In other words, I didn't know what she meant. Beware. What do they mean? They might mean, have you got another one by this author? They might mean, have you got another one with a cover like this? You don't know. <laughs> you need to ask, what do you mean by <laughs> another book like this? Which is actually the question you ask is, well, what did you like so much about it that you want again? Yeah? So now we're coming to the very thing we're going to do. <laughs> you see, what we're going to do is simply based on ordinary conversation. It's not based on some high academic theory. It's simply us looking at the way people talk when they are sharing that which they have done and like and want to share with their best friends and finding out what is inside that talk. How does it work? What are they doing? And as it turns out, they're doing one of four things. They're telling you what they liked about it. Uh, for instance, my best, one of my best friends, is a, I've known him for, what, 40 years. He's a bookseller and a poet. He's a huge reader. Very frequently, uh, I will say to him, oh, have you read, um, let me try and think of a real example. Uh, yeah, have you read Sam Beckett's um, What? What's his novel? Alan is likely to say, uh, yeah, yeah uh -huh, I have. Now, when he says that, I know what he means. And I'll say, I really enjoyed it. And he will begin by saying, not quite my cup of tea. <laughs> At which I'll say, well, what, what, what is it? What's, what, what, what's so bad about it? What's so wrong about it? And he will tell me. And I will then tell him what I think is so good about it. I'm trying to persuade him. <laughs> now, with me, for instance, it works like this, um, because I'm a slow reader. If you come at me with a book that's very thick, and you say, I've just read this wonderful novel, and you're my best friend, I will think inside me, oh, shit. <laughs> He's going to say, oh, you really must read it. <laughs> and that means three weeks. <laughs> yeah? But because he's my best friend, I say, oh, how interesting. <laughs> oh, tell me why I should read it. <laughs> and he will persuade me. Marriages break up on this. <laughs> really? <laughs> if you find that they never like what you like, you might as well have the divorce, because it's not going to go on for too long. <laughs> you better do some research before their marriage happens as to whether it's going to work. <laughs> it's the same with them. It's just basic stuff of us sharing what we have found out about this thing. Now, here's some tricks. 
the best person amongst young people, children, to have in the group is someone who hates the book. There's a, there's a strange rule. If in a group everybody absolutely loves the book, or absolutely loves the film, the conversation will go on for a few minutes and then go on to something else. Why bother to share all this stuff when we love it so much? We know what we mean, good, fine, let's get on to something else. The moment somebody says, oh, that's a load of crap, whoa, 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 <laughs> now I'm on my metal, I want to say, no, it is not. <laughs> this is what I found in it. And I will try to persuade that this is worth attention. That discussion will finally end up, he may not say, okay, I'll read it, but you have changed him. You have made him think about this object which he too easily rejected. So the catalyst, the little spark in the group of the person who says, oh, I really don't like this book, is gold. <laughs> you really, you know, that's excellent. Now, there's another trick. Uh, you're all meant to have uh, read this book. That was your homework. I'm not even going to tell you, ask you who has not read it. <laughs> but here's the next trick. Don't tell them this, but the people who haven't read the book are as useful as the people who don't like it. They think, particularly if you get a very naughty 14 or 50-year-old boy, by saying, no, I haven't done it, they've really got one over you. <laughs> oh, I'll show you, I haven't done my homework, <laughs> what are you going to do about it? <laughs> you say, fine, wonderful, you have a job to do. <laughs> This is your job. When we are talking about this book, if there's anything you don't understand in what we're saying, you're to tell us you don't understand it. You see what that will do? It will require the person who said that they think this, this, and this to explain in greater depth what they thought. So what is happening in this kind of discussion is deepening the discrimination, the thinking of the people who've read the book. It isn't so much really about the book at this point. It is about educating thinking, educating thought, by the richest use of language that you can get, based upon what they can say and know. Now, in my day, um, I'm just going to see my watch for a moment. Yeah, okay, good. In my day, uh, I'll give you an example. When I was 14, they sent me to the gymnasium late, two years late. Uh, they'd sent me to school for the thick kids before that because I was supposed to be not clever. And then, thank God, as a teacher who said, you're in the wrong place, and they sent me to the gymnasium. I had heard the name Shakespeare. Of course, every kid in England has heard the name Shakespeare. Oh, God, he's the greatest writer in the world, blah, blah, blah. And I don't want to know. The teacher walked in dressed in his academic gown, which in those days in the gymnasia, the grammar schools, they wore. And he had a pile of dirty old books. I mean, filthy, not rude. <laughs> <laughs> he gave them out and said, turn to page one. It was Macbeth by Shakespeare. We turned to page one. He stood at his desk and he read out the first scene. Uh, when shall we three meet again, in thunder, lightning, or in rain? When the hurly-burly is done, when the battle's lost and won, there to meet with, blah, blah, blah. He said, he finished the scene, he'd not told us anything about the story, and said, what have you got to say about that? <laughs> so we looked, because we knew this was a game. The game is to say what is in the teacher's head, to give him the answer he wants you to give. Now, the clever boys knew how to handle that. I hadn't a clue. So one of them said, um, well, sir, it has three witches in it. And he rose up onto his leg and said, but that's obvious. First mistake. How can you say something that is not obvious? Do you see the point? If it's not obvious, you can't know it. It's not there. You can only say what is obvious to you, what you can see, what you can understand, can't you? So for a teacher to say, oh, that's obvious, is a stupid remark. Of course it's obvious. It's obvious to that kid. He said it. 
Some kids might not have noticed that. So they tried. It's set on a heath. Yes, that's obvious. On they went, and finally he got angry and rose up in his black like a bat and said, have not you noticed that there are 13 lines? <laughs> oh, sir, there are 13 lines. Good. In fact, they're not. You see what he's doing? Right at the beginning, he's wanting to establish that Macbeth is about the supernatural. That was going to be his line. Where had he got that from? He'd got it from an essay written in the 1920s by a critic called J.M.W. Tilliard. He was an Oxford man and had been taught by him. He was copying what he'd heard. Now, in fact, we didn't realise that, in fact, if you count them, there are 13 lines, but two of them are half lines. They're so that the actor can be shown how to say things because one character says the first half and another character says the second half, but it's actually one line as a rhythm. He was wrong. <laughs> but you see the game. Guess what's in my head. And when you've guessed that, you're right. If you say anything else, you're wrong. That was traditional teaching. It's utter nonsense <laughs> as a way of working in literary terms. What you're really wanting is for them to say what they have noticed because it's obvious to them and share that and to put it together, so, as I explained to you earlier, you get something bigger than any of them could have said on their own and means more than any of them had first thought. Yes, that's how it works. <laughs> now, what the teacher wants, as I told you first, the ordinary teacher, is that the kid comes to them saying, have you got another one like that? The teacher finds one and the kid reads again. And the more that happens, the more the teacher thinks she's successful. Oh, I've got his reading, reading a lot. Well, have you heard the name Enid Blyton? Really? God help you. <laughs> Enid Blyton, Enid Blyton, who wrote in the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, wrote more than 500 books for children beginning with the very youngest and going up to the early teens. Now, it is possible, I'm not saying anybody does this, it is possible as a child to read nothing else but Enid Blyton for the whole of your childhood. <laughs> there was an academic study once some years ago of how many books, an average, what is an average child, gets through between the age of five and ten and it was about 300 books. So in theory, <laughs> you know, Noddy, the character, up to The Secret Seven, and you could read nothing else. If you were a teacher and you found a child reading, 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 and rereading, <laughs> reading again, Enid Blyton, would you be pleased? Yes. You would? <laughs> Why would you be pleased? Because the kid is reading? But isn't, she, isn't that child simply being a clone of Enid Blyton? <laughs> same language, same thoughts, same plots, same ideas, same prejudices. She had a prejudice against policemen. She called them plod. She had a pre pre prejudice against any foreigner. All that's in the stories. You'd be happy? I certainly would not. Because what you're ever depending upon to educate someone is a variety of different thoughts, ideas, and language. That's how it's done. That's your job. Not to give them what they already know they like, but to take them where they didn't know they could go. That means the selection matters and how you introduce it to them. That's your job. <laughs> yeah? I, I wouldn't like it if a child was born able to read Shakespeare and read nothing but Shakespeare for the rest of its life. Great though he is, it isn't enough. There has to be more difference, variety, richness, other ways of thinking, other kinds of character, other kinds of embedded opinion. All right, now, we're near to the workshop time.